We're going to continue with our discussion about the Java Executor Completion Service, spending a little time right now talking about how it's implemented under the hood, how the Java Executor Completion Service implements the completion service interface. So far, we've talked primarily about the interface. Now we're going to talk a bit about the inner workings. So the way this works under the hood is that an executor is used to actually run the tasks asynchronously. And so you can see that the executor completion service takes an executor as one of the parameters. And when the results are completed after the asynchronous operations run in the background, then the executor completion service implementation places the results on this blocking queue. It's, it's called a, a completion queue, as you can see here. And once they're placed on the queue, then client threads can pull them off of the queue by invoking these methods take or pull, which is part of the executor completion service interface. So that's how you get things back after the operations have finished. So as a result, there's no need to explicitly access the a list of futures yourself, because those are hidden for you inside the executor completion service instance. So here, here's how the methods actually work. So here's the submit method. This is the thing that takes a task, either a two-way task or a one-way task, and gives it to the, the executor to run in a pool of threads. Remember that they both methods here return futures, but you never really use those futures. I'm not even sure, honestly, why they have them returned because you're supposed to wait until the results are finished and then take or pull from the executor completion service itself rather than working with the futures that come back from submit. Submit submits a two-way task and uh, it supports this async future model where the clients never block waiting on the future to complete, they block on the take method instead. The task that's passed in here is an instance of a callable and you can see what happens is there's a little adapter function here called new task for. And what new task for does is it takes a callable and it's going to wrap it up in something called a future task. We'll talk more about future task in a later lesson. Future task is basically something that can be run in the background and you can cancel it if you so desire. This, this interface doesn't support cancellation, but in general you could cancel it. You could also check to see if it's done. This interface doesn't do that. The main thing that the future task provides is a hook method that gets called back when something has finished. And so what happens here is when the run method of this future task is invoked, it will call the call method on this task. So you see the task is passed in. It's a callable. That's stashed away. And then the run method, which is what gets called by the background thread, will call the call method on the task that it's holding. And it'll get the result. And, and assuming all goes well, there's a call to a done hook method. So what happens here is that we then take the future task. This is like layer upon layer of, of adapters. We take the runnable future, which is a future task, whose run method will call the call method on the task passed in here as a parameter to submit. And then we wrap that future task, or that runnable future, inside a queuing future. And all that the queuing future does is it adds a done hook method. And when this done hook method's called, remember this done hook method is called by the uh, future task. So when, the done, when we're done with the processing, the done hook method is called. Here's the done hook method that gets called back. And as you can see, what it does is it adds that task that's completed to the completion queue. So these are just layers of adapters whose only purpose in life is to arrange so that we're going to take this callable, execute it as a future task, and then go ahead, I'm sorry, create a future task, then wrap that future task in a queuing future, execute this queuing future, it's going to get the run method from the future task, which we'll call the call method that was passed in as a parameter. It'll call the done hook method. Here's the done hook method. The done hook method goes ahead and enqueues the results onto the completion queue. A rather circuitous route, but that's the way it works. William? I'm 
I'm sorry, what's the question? Yeah, so you can see that queuing future is a future task. And so it's going to take this parameter and stash it away internal to itself, which it's going to use to do the actual work. And the only thing that queuing future really adds to this whole mix is it has a done method. And that done method is going to go ahead and add the finished result to the queuing, to the completion queue. And that gets called here when the run method calls call, gets a result, and then it calls the done hook. And here's the done hook method, which adds the result to the completion queue. And that result is this future that's passed in here. Uh, future task can run by itself, and, and it's, it's running when its run method gets called. So you can see that queuing future is an encap, this is, this is crazy layering, but queuing future is a future task. So that means that it's got a run method, and that run method will end up calling back to the callable call method, which is stashed away here by two layers of adapters. So this is the adapter pattern kind of run amok. So keep it, all right, so look at the layering here, right? So, <laughs> so here's what we've got. We, we are past a callable. That's the guy that's actually going to do the work. Then we take that and we wrap this thing up in a, we, we get back a runnable future. But if you take a close look, you can see that this method is going to, the new task for adapter method is going to call new future task. So it's going to make a future task. And a future task, if you were to look under the hood, implements the runnable future interface. So that means it has a run method. OK, so far, so good. So we got a future task. So we get this thing back. We get a future task. It's, it comes back as a runnable future, but it's actually a future task. We then go ahead, and, and, and here's what the future task's run method does. Because you can see future task implements runnable future. So this run method, this is the guy that actually does the bulk of the work. It's going to call the call method on the callable, and then call the done method on the future task. So what we then do is we wrap the runnable future, which is actually a future task, into a queuing future. <laughs> and what this does is it takes this runnable future, which is really a future task, and it stashes it away here. And because queuing future inherits from future task, it also gets a run method. And you can bet your bottom dollar, I don't show this code here, but you can bet your bottom dollar if you were to look at the run method on queuing future, the run method simply turns around and calls the run method on the task instance that's stashed away here. Um, and so when we end up executing the queuing future, it inherits the run method from future task. That run method will delegate to the run method on this task. And that will then turn around and um, call the done method, well, sorry. This call here, this done method call here, is actually going to end up calling this done method here that will add the task, which is a future, into the completion queue. So yes, it's, it's completely, it's the adapter pattern run amok. I didn't write this code. This is just the way it's run, written by my friend Doug Lee. Uh, and the whole point is to be able to make sure that when the call is finished, it gets the result put into the queue, into the completion queue. One-way tasks are the same. They just don't return a result. Here's how we get the results. So take, poll, and poll. All they really do is they just turn around and forward to the appropriate method on the completion queue, which is a blocking queue. So when take is called, it goes and says, hey, I'm going to block until there's something in that completion queue. And it'll just wait. And after it's done, it'll take off the completed future. And keep in mind that that future is completed. Um, so you don't actually have to block. Once, once you get something from take, the future you get back has already been completed. And the reason you know that is it wouldn't have gone in the queue if it wasn't completed in the first place. So then there's poll. Poll does the same thing. It just checks to see if there's a result. If there is one, you get it. If not, it returns null, so it doesn't block. And then timed poll waits up to a certain amount of time. And if it has something by that point, it gets it. Otherwise, 
a null is returned. So the consequence of this is you can, as we talked about before, you can have a pool of threads or one or more threads can be sitting here submitting work into the executor completion service. That work runs in the thread pool executor that's part of the executor that's connected to the executor completion service. And as the results finish, the completed futures are stuck back on the completion queue so that we can have one or more threads take them off. And you can actually have a pool of threads pulling stuff off. You can have a pool of threads putting things in, submitting the work. You have a pool of threads that are actually doing the processing. So in theory, there could be you know, multiple pools of threads that are submitting work, processing work, handling the results of that work. So in steady state, you can imagine you'd have kind of a, a pipeline of things doing the processing in parallel. And assuming you've got plenty of cores on your machine, you'll be able to, to do a lot of stuff in parallel. Okay, that's the end of that discussion.